Great. Um, so I'm here with Mark Andreessen, um, who is the uh, co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz. And uh, um, so let's, uh, Mark, let's talk about, um, so you, you way back were a, um, a recipient of government grants, yep. right? Netscape came out of that. Yep. Um, um, how, can you, can you talk about sort of how in your, I guess, how you see the, the role of academia as it relates to startups, venture capital, and how that's changed over the last, over your, you know, over your career? Yeah. So uh, first of all, it's great, great to see everybody back this year. For those of you who are returning, uh, we're, th we're thrilled that you're all here. So, um, so uh, my work at University of Illinois uh, around Mosaic, which later became Netscape, was was all was NSF funded, um, and so I, I owe the NSF a huge a huge debt of gratitude for that. Um, I also owe them a huge debt of gratitude for something else, which was turning down the additional funding um, that we requested. Um, and uh, one of my fondest uh, 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 mementos is the uh, is the cover sheet of the NSF proposal with the decline. Um, on it, um, and it was literally. And they, they, they were, by the way, they were completely right. It was uh, we 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 literally had so many people early on using Mosaic that we were dying under the customer support load. Um, uh, you, I mean, customer support is an overstatement because they were paying for it. So it was it was user user support, um, and so we we applied for you know being a university, it's like well go get more funding. So we applied for NSF funding to basically build a customer support team, um, and they informed us very kindly um, that that wasn't part of what NSF funds. Um, so that was a good catalyst uh, to uh, to uh, to go start a company, uh, which was which was very helpful. Um, so you know, there's been obviously just you know a lot of things have changed in the in the, in the last you know this is 23 years ago now, 22 years ago. So so many many things have changed. Um, probably my single biggest thing that I think has changed that we see uh, with academic computer science and venture capital. Probably the biggest change, and I think this holds generally. I know this holds for my, my alma mater, and I think this holds more generally. Um, when I was getting my computer science degree at Illinois in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the department sent just an overpowering message to the undergrads um, that the purpose of the department was to mint PhDs um, and future professors, um, and that industry was a very kind of you know <clears throat> lower class, you know <clears throat> sideshow, um, you know dead end um, kind of thing. Um, and um, they were very, very clear on that. Um, and um, that, I think, had a lot to do with, obviously, the selection of the material you know, with a, a, with a much greater focus on theory than practice. Um, and then I think, I, I believe it even had a selection on things like programming languages for the coursework. Um, uh, I think the, the, the faculty actually went out of their way to pick languages that would never, ever be useful um, in a production environment. Um, and so I knew Pascal and Scheme really well. Um, which turned out to be not that helpful. Um, so the biggest change, um, and I guess you know, people could probably argue both sides of this, but the, the biggest change is just we, we have a sense for a lot of universities we deal with that the computer science departments have a much, I mean, they still want to breed PhDs and, and, and professors, but uh, a much bigger focus on practical impact in industry. Um, and you know, the students that we see coming out generally have a, a, a large amount of practical skill um, in addition to theoretical skill, um, which I think has been a, a, a dramatic change. Um, and what, what do you think about the idea that um, that you know people say that um, uh, Silicon Valley isn't working on big problems? Yep. Um, that that maybe uh, you know I don't know that only you know we used to have the space program, we used to have um, we were promised self-driving cars, and we got Twitter. We went to the moon. Yeah, we did yeah. go to the moon. What's upon a time? Um, so you know, what do you yep. think about that? Yep. Do you feel like uh, the computer? I guess both the computer science academic community and the and industry is, is tackling big problems? Yeah, so there's kind of two critiques right now in the media um, and in kind of popular discussions around this topic that apply to tech. Um, critique number one is tech's not working on big problems. You know, it's basically all, you know, everything in Silicon Valley is these silly little apps and like, why don't we take on the hard problems? Um, and of course, the other critique is we're like, tech is having way too big an impact on our culture and society um, and like throwing everything in upheaval and destroying all the jobs and reordering all the industries um, and changing the culture um, and just having this disastrous impact and you know, the impact needs needs to slow down. Um, nobody uh, attempts to ever reconcile uh, those two critiques. Um, and the same commentators will literally write both critiques in like different columns, you know, two weeks apart without ever attempting to reconcile them. Um, and so, and, and when I call them on it, they, they basically say, yeah, yeah, but it's all consistent because the tech industry is having a huge industry, it's just all negative. Um, which I think is maybe just slightly too cynical of a view. Um, so, 
I would say I'm kind of a little bit of a split mind on this myself, um, which is I do think it's, it's unfair and inaccurate to say the tech industry uh, and, computer, and computer science as a field um, is not tackling big problems. And I, I think that it's just it's obvious, you know, when you when you look around, um, you know, the nature of a lot of the things um, uh, that, that people are working on are, you know, really go after, you know, really kind of foundational things. Like I think communication um, is actually a really foundational thing um, in terms of how our civilization works. Um, you know, obviously money, financial services is being reordered with technology. Um, now logistics, how the real world works, transportation, uh, real estate are being reordered. Um, you know, culture, society, um, you know, is being deeply affected by technology. And so I think that there are, there are a lot of big problems actually being tackled. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's a fair critique, and I think this is the part of Peter Thiel's critique that I agree with. It's a fair critique that there are many fields that are not moving as fast as they could. Um, and in particular fields, you know, applications of computer science or other fields of engineering that intersect more in the world of atoms as opposed to the world of bits. And so, um, you know, drug discovery is an obvious one, um, you know, advances, you know, in mechanical engineering, advances in, you know, space travel, um, you know, lots of different areas um, where you would say, you know, cars, um, where you would say, boy, you know, you would think that we could make more rapid progress. Um, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, so I look at that and I kind of say, we now have the opportunity to make progress in many of those fields. And in fact, the best way to make progress in many of those fields is to apply more computer science. Um, and so I count myself as an optimist. Um, uh, but you know, nevertheless, I do think there, you know, there is something to the critique. Like people are quite capable of looking at the huge advance that has been made in their smartphone um, over time and then looking at the advance that's been made in their kitchen or in their car. And I think you, you can kind of see that there's been a difference uh, in the rate of improvement. And it's an exciting prospect to be able to go tackle some of these other fields. Um, so going back to the academic question, so sta obviously Stanford and Berkeley and some other schools have been especially successful at um, at, at seeding uh, startups that go on to be very successful. Um, why do you think that? Is? I mean, obviously some of it's proximity to industry and being here, but there seems to be other factors. Like, can you? And, and I think specifically also for people here who who are thinking about how they can make their own universities more entrepreneurial, like what do you think the key lessons are? Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a case study of this in a lot of ways. Um, you know, in theory, I could have started uh, my company out of Illinois in practice. I think that was impractical at the time. Um, may or may not still be impractical, but it was definitely impractical at the time. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm an import, you know, I'm a, I'm a classic import to Silicon Valley. Um, I speak with the zealotry of the converted. Um, you know, I've, I've adopted Stanford for, for a lot of the work that, 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 that I do out here. Um, and so I, you know, sort of think that I have a reasonably good understanding of the, the, the delta between the approaches. Um, I think a lot of it has become obvious uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I would highlight a couple things that I think Stanford and Berkeley do particularly well. Um, I think one is um, there is, and again, for better or for worse, but I think for better, there's very deep connectivity between Stanford and Berkeley and then, and then the Valley uh, at, a, at a ground level. Um, and so there's just a, a very porous barrier um, for the professors and for the students um, and for the administration. Um, and you know, the administration is an example. Like we all, you know, people, like we all know the, the the leadership at Stanford, and they spend spend a lot of time. In fact, you know, it's not an accident that, that Stanford picked as their president some time back. You know, John Hennessy, um, who, in addition to being a legendary theoretical computer scientist, um, it was also himself a former company founder. Um, and so, and you know, maybe the best university president anybody's ever had. Um, you know, that's worked very well. Um, the other thing that I think Stanford in particular has done really well um, is Stanford has been what I would consider to be the most enlightened in the sense of understanding the full kind of cycle of life um, of, of um, ideas being incubated in your university and then companies being formed and then in the fullness of time. Uh, the wealth creation that can happen through company formation and success, and then the philanthropy um, that can flow back into the university. Um, and if you walk around the Stanford campus, you know it's not an accident that there's the Jim Clark Building, right? And there's the Jerry Yang Building, and there's the you know there's the Bill Gates Building, and you know it's just building after building after building. The Hewlett, you know, the, the Hewlett and Packard guys did a lot. Um, my father-in-law, actually not in computer science and in, in, in real estate, but is, is another example of that, went to Stanford on a scholarship. Um, <laughs> my father-in-law went to Stanford on a geography scholarship the last year Stanford taught geography. Um, uh, <laughs> they canceled the major after he graduated. Um, but it was a good idea to keep the major until he graduated because he went on to become a very successful real estate developer and has donated what has to be, at this point, more than a billion dollars back to Stanford personally. 
Um, and there's you know, 150 buildings in the Stanford campus that he's paid for. Um, and so Stanford has a very kind of deep understanding that's evolved over time of the fact, it, and I would say in contrast to universities where the IP licensing office is dominant. Yeah. Um, and I, where think the, I think it's really a different, I would, I would describe it as a different business model, and then people, people really understand that, which is give it away in the beginning and then make the money back on philanthropy as yeah. opposed to, um, I don't know, I won't say which universities, but like some other ones that I have friends who've interacted with, uh, the, the, they, they have a very, they, they think the value lies in patent and transactional and licensing. Um, um, I mean, we like, we, you know, for example, when we make investments, we, we ask about patents, but it's like a side item. Like it's never actually core to any investment because anyone who's built a company knows it's a dynamic process. You're constantly building and any tech you start with, it's probably completely different in four years, five years. It's all about who you recruited, and the people you recruit tend to not like patents. They like open source software. They like, um, they you know, they they like, you know, cool open innovation or something like this. Um, and uh, I don't know. So I, I it's, it feels to me like a very I don't know like like a lot of people just really misunderstand how it works. Yeah. And it feels like a lot of, and you know, there's 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 legislation. There's the uh, was it the uh, I forget the name of the there's a you know there's a law on this that people are, are grappling with, and so it's a complicated topic. Um, but you know, my University of Illinois, as an example, my alma mater, I think in the last 20 years has made significant progress, um, um, and they now have the the results to show for it. So the the first thing was the the Beckman Center, which appeared when I was there, which is kind of this just like absolutely amazing complex um, up on the north side of campus from Arnold Beckman, who was a legendary company founder who came out of Illinois decades ago. Um, and then Tom Siebel, um, you know, has basically rebuilt the Illinois Engineering Campus um, in a very similar model. And so I think, you know, this is an area in which success should lead to success. As you have more and more examples um, of how this happens, um, you should be able to, uh, you know, to be able to see I think, this I think also the, the model that works in, medi in the medical sphere and in, uh, in pharma licensing is more transactional patent oriented okay. and does seem to work um, and is very different than computer science and that throws people off. But yeah. Um, uh, okay, great. Uh, let's let maybe move and talk a little bit about. Uh, I think maybe we'll do like ten more minutes of this, and I bet there's going to be a ton of questions afterwards, and we'll save the questions for then. So, um, uh, um, computer science education. So, um, uh, New York City just announced that they're going to, in, t in the next ten years, <laughs> start teaching computer science in, in all. Uh, um, I think I think elementary and high schools. Um, for the most part, it's very. I think it's it's computer science is rarely taught at the at the pre college level. I think, um, um, and it's as I understand, you know, the, the the we we're constantly complaining about there being a shortage of computer science uh, expertise. Um, what you know, what do you think is going on there, and what can we do to fix it? Yeah, so I mean, there there is a cynical view, by the way. I mean, by default, you would say having every kid get taught computer science is a plus. There is a cynical view that says that if they teach computer science to school, they'll beat uh, curiosity on the topic out of the students, just like they do every other topic they teach. Um, and so there there is there there <laughs> there is a potential dark side. I hope that's not what happens. Um, the positive side seems you know overwhelmingly positive, um, which is uh, you know to talk about like a foundational technology of our time, you know, to learn about how software works and how to build software. You know, is really fundamental. Um, so it, you know, it's incredibly exciting. Um, obviously, there's a big dependency. It, it, good for kids to have a, you know, familiarity with it. It's, it, you know, you then get an inter interesting questions about how many, you know, how many computer science students can universities take, right? And then what's the dropout rate along the way? Um, and you know, you have all these problems around underrepresented groups, um, you know, with computer science degrees. And so if you still have the drop off take place in the university, um, you know, then you, you may not, you may not fix that problem. Uh, but it's certainly progress. Um, and then I think there's a deeper idea um, that I think is worth thinking about, which is the, the impact that computer science is going to have in many other fields, both in the academy and also in industry over time. Um, and something I think a lot about is a famous essay uh, on, uh, by uh, an Englishman named C.P. Snow uh, from the 1960s, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a famous essay. You can Google it if you haven't seen it. It's, um, it's, it's about what he calls the two cultures. Um, and C.P. Snow was this very interesting character, um, brief digression. C.P. Snow is an interesting character because he was both a chemist and a novelist. Um, and so he kind of was right brain and left brain, um, and he understood both worlds. Um, and he wrote this essay kind of at the height of the Cold War, and at the, specifically at the height of physics being kind of the top scientific field of its era. And so, you know, nuclear energy and space travel and the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb and all these, you know, incredibly central topics around physics. Uh, and he wrote this essay, and if you read the essay, it's like, you know, 60 years later, if you read the essay, and if you just substitute physics for physics, you just take physics out and you put computer science in, um, it reads exact, right? 
Um, and he talks about the two cultures. He basically says there's the, well, I'll adapt it. He says there's the computer science culture, the engineering culture, um, which is kind of ascendant um, culturally, um, because this science and this engineering you know, is, is reordering the world and having a huge impact. And all the physics people then, computer science people now are all cocky and aggressive and confident and say all these bold things. Um, and then there's the other culture, which is the artistic culture, the, the liberal arts culture. Um, and the liberal arts culture you know, is you know, art, art, art and literature and music and philosophy and political science and all these things, sociology, and, and they're very much on the defensive. Um, and they feel very you know, attacked and victimized and you know, are, are the days of liberal arts over because engineering is just going to take everything over. Um, and so he, he, he comes at it kind of from a sociological standpoint, and it's a, it's, a, it's a fun diagnosis to read. But then he proposes what he calls the third culture, um, which are the people who can bring the two, the two cultures together um, and the people who can bring you know, physics or now computer science into liberal arts and the people in liberal arts who can learn and understand, even if they're not engineers, can learn and understand how engineering works and how computer science works. And he basically proposes that the third culture will be able to do things that each of the cultures by themselves will be unable to do. Um, and I really think we, have an, we collectively have an opportunity to do that with computer science. We have an opportunity for computer science to have a hugely positive impact on many other fields of human activity. Um, and we have the opportunity to have computer science be something that is open and accessible to people who aren't going to be full-time programmers, but who are going to be able to learn about this, understand the mentality, and then be able to you know, really understand what's happening and be able to contribute. Um, and so my hope would be that that's what will you know, flow from these yeah. uh, investments in, in earlier CS education. And if, um, and if you had to pick areas, just some examples of what, what computer science might you know, computer science plus X, what would X be? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, you know, the obvious giant one right now is, bio, is biology um, and, and life sciences. And it just, it, it just seems to us like there's a revolution afoot in a fundamentally new way. Um, that's just extraordinarily exciting. Um, you know, now, you know, that's not really a two cultures thing because, you know, biology is also, you know, biology is closer to engineering than, a lot closer to engineering than liberal, liberal arts to start with. Um, you know, but for sure that. Um, and then I think in liberal arts, I think more and more, and you see a lot of this on, you know, Stanford's doing a lot of this. Um, a lot of other universities are as well, but, you know, there's, it's everything. It's, it's you know, literature, there's, there's new ways of thinking about literature, the written word, there's new ways of thinking about music, there's new ways of thinking about art. Um, you know, one of the really interesting things happening right now are the attempts to digitize um, you know, things like ancient ruins and artworks in, 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 in regions of the world that have lots of war and conflict. Um, so even in the worst case, if they get destroyed, we're able to have like a complete 3D recreation of like an ancient city. Um, and so there's, there's a potential to you know, kind of really advance cultural knowledge and understanding. Um, entertainment um, you know, is, is, is obviously a, a straightforward one. Um, education itself. Um, you know, software-driven education, um, you know, with all the tools and techniques we have in computer science applied to education, you know, is, is, seems like a huge opportunity. Let's, uh, let's talk more about bio, because that's something that we spend a lot of time on lately. Like, what, you know, specifically, um, you know, are, are, is happening there that makes it, a, makes it an exciting time? Yeah, so I think the core foundational thing that's happening is something very subtle um, and very important. And this is happening in other fields as well, but we're definitely seeing it in bio. Um, which is, um, you know, biologists like physicists or chemists um, or a lot of other, you know, sort of highly advanced uh, specialists in different, er different areas of science and engineering. You know, up until 10 years ago, if you would meet, you know, kind of a state-of-the-art, you know, world-class research biologist, um, odds are they weren't very comfortable with computers. Um, and odds are they had never really programmed. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in physics, an example, my job in college, my first job in college was actually to write computer code for physicists uh, who hated computers. Um, and it's, it's been the same thing in biology you know, for a long time. And you, you meet a lot of senior biologists who are just still sort of fundamentally uncomfortable uh, with a lot of this stuff. Or they have a grad student who writes, you know, who writes, writes the code for the lab. Um, you know, the big thing that's happened is there's just so many now young, incredibly smart uh, you know, biology PhDs, doctors, chemistry PhDs who are coming out. And it turns out, in addition to being fully qualified in those fields, they've also been programming, um, in many cases, since age 10. Um, and so they've got that same foundation in software and computers. You know, they had a PC in the house growing up. You know, they've had a smartphone. You know, the really young ones have had a, you know, have had a, <laughs> have had a smartphone for most of their life. Um, uh, and they've got the same kind of you know, foundational knowledge about computer science and software that a lot of the kids in, computers, in computer science have, because they started programming at, at age 10. Um, and so I think it's actually, a, first and foremost, is a change in the field, um, which is, uh, the, the as a consequence of generational uh, change, the field, as well as other fields, is just going to change as a consequence of that. 
Um, and then, you know, you'd have to add to that the, the more formal efforts for interdisciplinary research at the university level. Um, and then there's the big macro trends actually happening in the science. And so, you know, the realization of genomics is a mature field. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the enormous advantages of cloud computing and big data, you know, now being able to be applied to biology. Um, uh, you know, the, you know, computational biomedicine, all, all these sort of fundamental areas um, uh, of, of things that can be done now. Qu you know, quantified self as an example we think is going to evolve into, you know, a, a cornerstone of biology in the future. You know, we, we, you know we, one of our theories is we think we're living in the Stone Age today in the sense of, like, we really don't know what's happening in our bodies. Like, we don't know what's happening in our bodies until something goes wrong and then we get whatever tests we get. And then if something goes right again, we kind of go back to our state of ignorance. Um, whereas in the future, I, I, we just think it's going to be standard that you're going to know everything that's happening in your body and you're going to know your, your blood work and you're going to know your genome and you're going to know your biome and you're going to know your MRI and you're going to know all these things all the time. Um, uh, and so there's, you know, an enormous turn that's going to happen as a consequence of that. Um, so just to get specific, if you're a professor in computer science and you want to encourage, you want to get more involved in entrepreneurship or encourage your students to or your school to, um, you know, what can we, I mean, it's part of really what we're doing with this conference is to try to kind of um, increase the, I don't know, communication, I guess. Um, but what, what can, what, 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 I guess, advice would you have or um, kind of suggestions or et cetera for people in the audience? Yeah, so, you know, in any given, I would say a couple things, sort of in any given era in the Valley, there are a set of venture capital firms that are kind of front and center. And, you know, we've kind of tried to make ourselves, you know, one of those, but, you know, they're, I will grudgingly concede that there are others. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, there's, there's, you know, three, four, five, six, ten, 10, whatever the number is, but firms that are kind of on the leading edge funding the next generation of interesting companies. Um, and so, and those firms, as, as we do, tend to have a very panoramic view of, what, of what's happening in, in industry. And so I think we're, you know, I think it's why we're thrilled to have you guys here, but I think we're, you know, we're able to be a resource on that. And, the, you know, to a certain extent, the other firms maybe. Um, uh, and then there's a set of companies, you know, there's, there's, there's a, um, there's, like to say, like there, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of tech companies. Um, in any given generation of companies, there's three or four or five that are kind of clearly top of the heap. Um, you know, kind of have you know they're kind of at scale and are doing very interesting, important things, um, but have not become kind of classic big companies that just kind of drift along. You know, sort of companies that are still alert and alive. Um, you know, often still run by their founders um, and are, you know, hiring voraciously, right? And so they're just, you know, they're just a, a sink for talent, you know, coming out of all of your programs. Um, and so I think between, you know, the top handful of venture capital firms, the top handful of tech companies, um, I think, you know, these days it's, it, you know, the, the, those are the key things that you want to really be, you know, even if there's no formal connectivity, just, you know, associated, you know, understand, know people at those, at those firms uh, and at those companies. Um, and then, you know, the other, and I'm sure this is obvious, but just it, we, 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 when it works, it works really, really well, um, is just the natural flow of students coming out into industry um, and then retaining connectivity back into their programs um, and, you know, being brought back to campus, you know, bringing the learnings back, you know, telling the next generation of students, uh, you know, what the opportunities are, um, you know, being guided by, you know, the professors who are up to speed on what's happening out here about, about where to go and what to do. Um, and we, you know, we, I would say we see lots of success stories of, of how this works and works really well. Um, and then, you know, we, we do see cases where, you know, there are programs where there's just, they're just completely, you know, still isolated um, after all this time and the students really have very little idea of what's happening out here uh, or in industry broadly. Um, and so for those of you who are doing that well, it's, it's going great. Um, I think it, that mentality could be applied more comprehensively in the field uh, at a lot more schools. Maybe um, if there, we can take some questions now. If, if, uh... I assume there are some. Yeah. You're experiencing sort of funding uh, startups that come from the university. Yeah. What is the one mistake that you made that you say, ah, oh, I'm not going to do this again? Yeah. So there is a there is a there there are enormous successes, and so a lot of the best tech companies in in the world today flow directly out of. I mean, my my company's example of this. A lot of the best examples flow directly out of universities, and so and we have a whole generation of these companies, um, you know, that, that have done this. And so there 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 is a very good success kind of model. Um, that works incredibly well. Um, there's a very clear failure case, um, th which is the dominant failure case that I think that we see, um, which is um, the professor has the idea, um, the professor starts the company, um, but with no intention of going full time at the company. The professor runs the company or gets it started for a year uh, or on an interim basis or on a part time basis, um, gets associated with some seed investor or some second tier venture capital firm that goes out and finds a professional, a mediocre professional CEO. Um, uh, uh, the professor then is like, okay, my job is done. The professor goes back uh, to teaching, um, and then the company just drifts and ultimately uh, falls over and dies. Um, 
And so, and, and so what, what's missing there? What's missing there is, is basically, and this is just a lesson we learn over and over again, like there is no substitute in these companies for having the core team, and in particular, the CEO, the person who's going to run the company, um, be people who are really strong and really sharp um, and really you know, clued in on, on, on what needs to happen and then are really full-time like really able to be full time and be able to be full time on a sustained basis. It doesn't have to be the professor though. Often it's a, it's the it's like the key grad students, right? I mean, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that so I was going to say is that that's that's exactly right. So that that's the model the the the, the variation that works really well um, is when there's one or ideally a set of students, a uh, set of grad students um, who really understand this and really want to do it and the professor basically sponsors you know if in, in, in sort of informally um, sponsors the creation of the company um, or helps with the creation of the company um, and then the students actually run the company the professor can be involved as an advisor, or can be involved, you know, the board of directors, or whatever the right thing is, or can just go back and, you know, and teach, uh, you know, go, and, and go back and do, do more research. Um, but where the company is really formed around around the students, um, and you know, Silicon Graphics was a, you know, back back in the, which was a huge success, uh, you know, with this model was was an exact example of that. You know, Netscape was another. There's been a whole bunch of examples like that. Um, yeah. And so it's almost the prof the professor as the Sherpa um, and as the as the advisor and as the guiding light. Uh, and the professor might be very involved for the first year with the idea and the fundraising and catalyzing the entire thing, but where there there's this core of of people who are the students who are really able to pick this up and carry it forward. Nasira, you know, for us, Nasira was a recent example of this, uh, where you know Scott, uh, uh, you know uh, Scott and Nick uh, were, were very involved in the formation of the company, um, but um, you know they they found they found a good person to work with to be the CEO, and then the the, the CTO was Martine, who was the the, the top grad student in the field. Um, who really carried the company forward. And <laughs> Martine now actually is a big executive at VMware and runs, I don't know, a thousand people and has a $500 million business working for him. Um, and so that, that's a particularly vivid, kind of clear success story. And I think that's, that's the kind of uh, precedent to look at. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would argue it's actually a special case of a, of a, bro of a broader misunderstanding of startups that's, cult that's that outside of academia as well. Um, and it comes from pop culture. You know, you see the Facebook movie, and they like write an equation on the board, and it's as if that equation were like the secret, right? Um, when in fact, it's ten years of tons of engineering and marketing and all sorts of other things, right? And network effects, and you know, the, just a million other things. Um, or you know, the the idea that you, the I, there's, I didn't see the movie, but it's like the guy who invents the intermittent windshield wipers. You know, so you invent this idea, you patent it, you hand the patent over to the business guy, who then goes and next in the next scene, he's like living in a mansion, right? Like, it's like, and so, um, and it's sort of the pop culture view of it. And when in fact, what startups really are is a dynamic process um, that probably, you know, 90% of it is frankly recruiting a great uh, product and engineering team. And what we find is only, it just, just empirically, is it only great product and engineering people are able to recruit those people. Um, and the product ends up changing a lot over time. Um, I almost never see, I, I don't know, like, I don't know, Nicera, for example, but I've been involved with many startups where it came from academia, but when you actually look at the product four years later, it was very, very different. I mean, some of the core ideas might have been there, but there were a lot of changes and that, that, that were non-trivial um, that you needed, you know, sort of the core people to do. I mean, yeah. that's your experience. So we funded a series, so we funded a series of NetWQ's networking lab, and it was the OpenFlow. OpenFlow was the, the sort of protocol, was the approach, um, and Martin had, had, had been one of the main people doing that. Um, and so they start in a series, and we're all excited because we're like, this is great. We've got OpenFlow. We've got the OpenFlow technology. We've got the OpenFlow team. Like, this is going to be the OpenFlow company. Um, and in the first board meeting, Martin sets up down and he's like, okay, the first thing you guys need to understand is we're throwing away all that open flow stuff. <laughs> yeah. And Ben and I went, what? And he said, you know, that was great for a research lab, but like what for commercial applications, we need to do another, we need to do an, another version. We need to take everything we learned from that research and we now need to build the actual commercial product. Um, and so I mean, he effectively- yeah, Even Google, like PageRank, yeah. people talk about PageRank. I mean, it was very quickly copied by the idea of using inbound links to, as a part of the ranking algorithm. Yeah. It was very quickly copied by the competitors. Yeah. They actually did a lot of other things. It's one of like, PageRank is like one of like 900 yeah. factors now that yeah. go into a Google search result. Yeah. And the other 899 happened after they left yeah. Stanford. Now, by the way, there are professors. Jim Clark was my partner when I started Netscape. He started Silicon Graphics. He was actually a case of a professor who left, um, who, who left academia and, and went and started a company and, and, and went. I feel like the two exceptions are RSA and Qualcomm, maybe, yeah. arguably, where there actually yeah. is sort of a core. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you'd agree, but like, yeah. 
there's a few exceptions where it actually does yeah. happen. In the car. It always annoys, like Instagram, you know, there's a couple of these like, really high profile cases where the guy just does have an epiphany and it becomes this, and it, and it takes, it, what, unfortunately it unwinds like five years of us trying to argue the opposite <laughs> point because they're very high profile cases. Yeah. But it I would just occasionally yeah. happen, but for the most part. There is no substitute. There is no substitute. The big, the big takeaway, and this applies to everything we fund, and it's what we work on all the time. There is no substitute to the first five years of people in the office, 18 hours a day, six days a week, grinding away. Um, and it's grinding away on making the product work for customers and then working with the customers. Like it's just, there, there's, there's no way to, we, we have not found a way to shortcut that yet. Um, and so however the process of starting a company forms, it has to really focus in on that. Great. Can you talk a bit about the leadership development piece? So on a day-to-day -day basis as a professor, I am mentoring and helping students to develop technically, but also it's a core commitment of mine to help them to develop personally as well. So can you talk a bit about how we, in our mentoring rules, can help to develop people who will eventually be strong leaders who are technically competent, but in addition to that also like relationally competent in terms of being able to be that technical CEO founder person? Yeah, so I think there's two sides. I'm glad you asked that. So I think there's two sides. Um, I think there's the soft side. There's sort of, I would say, is the, the informal side of leadership and then the formal side of leadership. Um, so the informal side is just being able to work with people and being able to lead people. And I think a lot of that has to do with what then, you know, what then happens in the lab or in the, in, in the department. Um, and so, you know, having the high potential people be able to be in some kind of leadership role, you know, on projects uh, or on research programs, um, you know, relatively early, um, you know, is certainly going to be a good thing. E easier said than done, but, you know, giving, giving people the opportunity to lead and then giving people the coaching um, along the way or being able to find mentors who can come in and work with them on developing their sort of, the sort of, not the soft skills, but like the informal skills, the people skills, you know, that you're, you're kind of getting at. Um, there's another side of it that um, uh, is also, I think, a big opportunity, um, which is the formal side, which is business skills training for engineers um, and for computer scientists. Um, one of the things that is very exciting, actually, at, at, and this is, I know there are other schools doing this, but we see this most vividly at Stanford and, and at, at Berkeley. Um, uh, Stanford and Berkeley now both have organized programs to teach uh, students in the engineering school business skills. Um, and this is, this is the funniest, the, 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 the comical version of this is what happens at Stanford, um, which is there's this sort of time-honored tradition um, at Stanford where the Stanford Business School students, the MBAs, you know, the, the, the new MBAs kind of view themselves as, as future CEOs. Um, and so, you know, they'll come up with an idea and then they'll go try to basically, you know, they'll go to the computer lab at like midnight with a pizza and try to get like an engineer to help them on the idea. Um, and uh, there was just a Dilbert cartoon that kind of immortalized this where the pointy haired boss, you know, goes up to Dilbert and he says, I've got a great idea for a startup and now all I need is an engineer and some funding. Um, and Dilbert says, you know, the economic term for what you have is nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so um, the, the, the Stanford version of that literally is the MBA trying to go get the engineer. Um, the much better model um, is for the engineer to have the business skills, um, for the engineer to be a top flight engineer, but also have the business skills to be able to start a company. And then the engineer hires the MBA um, as, you know, the head of marketing or the head of sales or the head of finance, right? And so we, we would always prefer that the engineers have the business skills so that they can be in the leadership position. Um, uh, you know, in these companies, e even at the even at the founding level, um, you know, some schools are very resistant to this idea. You know, that engineers should be trained in business because it, it, you know, again, it seems like a corruption of the process of what of what of what they're trying to do in their in their field. Um, some schools have gotten very enlightened on this. Um, What's so striking about the Stanford and Berkeley programs is those programs are completely separate from the business school. Like, they're the, it's different different faculty. <laughs> Um, and we, we see this, you know, we'll go over and speak at Stanford and, you know, you'll get, you'll get an invitation to go speak at the business school um, and they'll, they'll all be the, you know, the future pointy-haired bosses. Um, and um, you'll get the invitation to speak at the business class for the engineering school and it's a completely different set of students. They're all engineers that want to learn about business. Um, and so I think that's a really good idea. And, I, you know, and I don't mean it's like, I'm not saying it's like half and half, but I'm saying it's like, you know, I don't know, four or five courses, you know, over the course of four years. Um, to be able to learn, you know, the fundamentals of business, to be able to learn, you know, a ma maybe a management course, maybe a startup course, maybe a finance course, um, and maybe one or two other classes, like an econ course. Because um, then you can, you, with just a little bit of starting knowledge like that, you can set the engineers up to be able to think, about, think of themselves as business people out of the gate. I mean, I, I, I was, I, I did it, I guess I did it the hard way, which is I, I didn't take any business, it never even occurred to me to take a business course, they never offered. Um, and so everything I learned about business happened after I graduated. Um, and I think in retrospect, had I had any formal training in it, I think I would have been better. I mean, the other, the other good model, I think, is to go to a startup, a relatively small startup, 
for a couple of years. Um, or intern, I mean, obviously. Yeah, intern. Internships are, so. See, like Waterloo is a great example of that, yeah. where they, I think they, they have, uh, it's like, it's like they have a crazy number, like six or plus internships over their four years of undergrad. Um, the whole sort of it's deeply integrated sort of working in industry and working in, uh, in, in their coursework. Um, and they come out, they, we see them coming out of college and they're just like, they're just very sophisticated. Another good example, um, uh, Penn's M&T program, so they combine, right? It's like uh, some smaller, I think it's mostly engineering, but some portion of Wharton. Um, uh, there's some, some interesting examples, but sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's I agree with all that. Um, uh, on the internship side, this may be obvious, but it's very important for what's happening out here, which is college recruiting for computer science students has gotten to be brutally difficult just because there's so many tech companies and there's just so few top flight computer science departments. And so, you know, it's it's World War III. The way the companies are looking at it is they're just desperate to be able to hire your students when they graduate. Um, and what they've now learned is they can't wait until your students graduate. They have to they have to get them they have to get them sooner or they'll 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 never have a shot of getting them. And so they have to get them at the in, at the intern they have to get them at the intern level. Um, and so in the last five years alone in the Valley, the tech companies have hugely increased their focus on their internship programs. Um, and basically, the goal is to get all of your best students as interns and then be able to basically get them locked in at least a year in advance to be able to come on full time. Um, the good news of that for you guys is like, you know, and I, I don't even know if the tech companies are being fully transparent with you on this, but like, they're desperate. They're really desperate. Um, and so I think you guys have the opportunity to really set your students up in these in these best of class companies. Um, and, and in fact, not just one, but like a whole series of them over, over the course of time. That was one of the things, um, and then on the Waterloo point, that was one of the things, when I was at Illinois, it was one of the things I give them a lot of credit for is they also had, they did, they call it the co-op program, yeah. um, but they would, um, you know, they would, there was a, there was, they, they would support you in going out for, I think I worked at, one of my stints was a full nine months, um, summer and, and, and then the fall semester uh, at IBM, um, which was just a, you know, for me as a, as a kid was just a huge, you know, be able to spend nine months in a company, you know, it was just, I learned just an enormous amount. In Chris, in regard to uh, venture funding and venture formation world and other macro forces that might affect it, what on the short to medium term horizon do you see as worrisome and what do you see as very exciting, specifically in regard to any, any industry such as financial services, life sciences, and so on and so forth? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I think as, we, as Mark mentioned, bio is an area that we've made a number of investments in lately um, and probably will continue to. Um, uh, certainly a lot of the things, the obvious things, continue to be interesting. So, you know, machine learning related big data. Uh, we do a lot of data center infrastructure. Um, you know, you'll hear some of these buzzwords, but they're, but they're, I think some of them are genuine trends like, you know, containers and software defined networking and things like this. Um, uh, we spend uh, you know, a lot of interesting things. For example, our investment in Oculus and, and, uh, and some of our drone investments have been based on the, the idea that uh, the mobile phone has revolutionized uh, the quality and price of these components. And basically, if you look at a lot of these devices like an Oculus and drones, they're just basically reconfigured mobile phones. Um, and so that just sort of unlocks all these new um, Product possibilities. Um, satellites. There's a no, no, there's new generation of satellites, yeah. microsatellites that are literally like flying Android smartphones, like yeah. in, in space. And yeah, people, a I mean, fraction people, of the price of what you used to be able to do. People, people. I think the naive view of something like sort of Moore's law um, used broadly, it's sort of the the you know the, ma the rapid improvement of technology. The naive view is it just happens as like a law of physics. The the more accurate view is it's it's kind of a vector that gets it's a ray gun that gets pointed on a certain area and it's now gotten points pointed on you know on small um, you know supercomputers that have ex lots of sensors etc and that has led to this rapid acceleration in in uh, in the just the quality and the and decrease in price so that's an interesting area um, uh, you know there's there's still like you know with mobile phones there's now they're, you know, we see all these companies, the kind of the Uber Lyft kind of companies of taking these, everyone's got a supercomputer in your pocket, what, what new real world services can you create as a result? Um, so we see a lot of innovation around that. Um, we continue to be very excited about VR. I mean, I, I see it as like we're now in a stage where we're about to see a whole bunch of interesting VR platforms get launched and there's gonna be a wave of applications built on top of it. Um, financial, you mentioned financial services. I think that's another area where we're seeing, you know, like Lending Club and sort of this next generation of banks. Um, we're, we're very interested in Bitcoin, which is a sort of a more radical take on new next generation finance. Uh, I don't know, what am I forgetting? Um, 
I'd highlight one really sort of subtle, one really positive subtle thing and one uh, problematic subtle thing. So positive subtle thing, um, uh, you know, when I, when I came in the industry, the one thing that everybody knew for sure was you could never build a company selling early adopters because there weren't enough of them. Mm. Um, and so the big focus always was you got to find a product that the mainstream is going to like out of the gate because um, early adopters, there's just, there's just only a small handful of hobbyists who will buy something before it's really ready for, for, for the mainstream. Um, a subtle but important thing that's happened in the last 20 years is the market of early adopters now is now very large. Um, and so, and I just like look at it numerically, like the number of total internet users in like 1999 was maybe 50 million people. Um, all in, right? Um, today, the number of early adopters for any of the new categories of products that we talk about, it's, it starts at like 50 million people globally um, who are interested in any new thing, who are interested in Bitcoin, or interested in drones, or interested in Soylent, any, any, yeah. a, any of these new things. And so, we can actually fund and bring products to market, um, hyper, you know, basically targeted specifically at early adopters, um, which is a really interesting way to be able to get new ideas out faster. It's, if it, just to give you one example, if you read the press about virtual reality and Oculus launching the new product next year, they'll say, well, the problem with it is it requires a very high-end PC. Um, that turns out there's 15 million people with that, with that spec of PC already, and there'll be, that'll be 20 million soon. And so that's considered a niche now. but. You know, it, the reality is 20 million is enough to get a very interesting company built and then to do, you know, and, and what happens with a lot of these new platforms, you need enough people to kind of get to critical mass, to get sort of developers excited, to get the suppliers excited. And and so we're seeing that kind of, I think I think of it as r roughly there's 100, 100 million software developers now. Um, and that roughly overlaps with things like Reddit users and Steam users and Stack Overflow users and sort of this group of you know th people that are interested in 3D printing and interested in Bitcoin. And so it's kind of 100 million of these kind of maker hacker types, um, uh, which is you know is enough to build a company on, right? I mean, it's certainly enough, and it's certainly enough to get the kindling going. And so we we see, I'd say. Um, you know, a good a good portion of our companies uh, start start there. Um, yeah. Whenever anybody now says, "Oh, nerds are going to love it," but normal yeah. people aren't going to care, yeah. like like <laughs> full, yeah. full throttle. I mean, the other part. thing is like you know, so you know, we have some soil out there which you should try. The funny thing, to, the other thing to remember about nerds is that nerds now control mass media because the internet is mass media. And so if you ask people you know, on the street about the word soil, they'll mention the movie from the 60s, 70s, Charlton Heston movie, and, you know, which is about eating people and has a negative connotation. <laughs> if you Google the word soil, it's all about this new food because, you know, and it's like there's like one link, on, I think it's on page two, maybe it's whatever, uh, you know, about that. So the point is, you know, the, and that's because Reddit and and Hacker News and the rest of the internet has been referring to using the word in a different way, right? You're referring to this new um, superfood. Right. And so, um, so I think another point to be made is not only are the nerds a big market with lots of money who like to buy new things, they also control um, the, the modern media, you know, which is links and other kinds of things. Yeah, but, well, more and more if you watch late night talk shows, it's just stuff that was on the internet three yeah. days ago. Yeah. Um, so the subtle, the subtle, the subtle negative thing is happening. It goes back to the, the big, the big. It's, are we going after big problems? Question from before, which is um, more and more the interesting things that are happening as computer science gets applied to more fields. Um, more and more, we're hitting the real world, um, which is to say, we're hitting real world regulations, um, we're hitting real world laws, we're hitting real world politics, right? And so, you know, for Uber to come to market and go, you know, head to head with the taxi commissions in 150 cities at the same time, you know, is a considerably different challenge than you know Facebook launching in 150 cities, where it never had to worry about anything like that. Um, and so whether and then so it's whether you know it's the FDA for all our work in bio and food it's the FDA for all of our work in on, you know for drones um, it's the FAA for all the work in satellites it's NASA right and so there's like a you know there's a 50 or 100 year old government agency now involved in basically um, you know in a very large percentage of the new things um, now that's not that doesn't that's not daunting in the sense of that doesn't prevent the companies from being funded and that doesn't prevent them from succeeding but it adds another layer of practical difficulty. Um, that just has to be taken into account when you start these companies to be able to navigate your way through politics and laws. Yeah. Yep. Uh, back to the topic of patents and IP for a moment. Yep. Um, very specific question, but probably a lot of us in here are building companies based on work that we did at the university that is perhaps patented uh, at the university and the university yeah. owns, so we have to license it from them. Uh, I'm just curious on your thoughts about this. Is this sort of a red flag or problematic from an investor's point of view or, or not so much? I'll give my answer then to Chris thing. So um, I, it depends on the university and it depends on the terms. So there's there are a lot. I mean, we, we do fund companies all the time that have licenses to university patents. Um, I would say in some cases, those are actually useful licenses. Like what I would argue is like the further down the stack, the more useful the patents are. 
like patents at the level of chips or at radios, um, you know, can be, or, you know, I don't know, memory or something like that can be incredibly uh, valuable. Um, patents at the level of software or applications we generally don't view as very, very valuable, and I, I could go into, you know, more detail why, but generally not very valuable. Um, you know, to be able to get the right team out of the university into a startup, if there is a licensing agreement that is only on the margin uh, for the economics, you know, then it's just a cost of doing business, um, and we'll kind of put up with it. Um, I have seen cases, and I've lived through cases, where the universities take a very draconian view on this, and the university licensing office has this just highly inflated view of the value of what they're going to be licensing, and they, they can kill companies in their cradle uh, by taking that approach. So I think a lot of it depends on the specifics of the university. Yeah, I would just add, I think, that some of the universities are doing themselves, I, I, we, we believe, a disservice by, by doing this, and are actually uh, counterintuitively, um, I mean, to, to them it may be counterintuitive, but we think they're actually generating less revenue by asking for more. But yeah. it's, 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 such a, it's such a counterintuitive argument that it's very hard to make. Um, uh, Nick from, Nick McEwen from um, NYSERA, actually, he spoke, I thought it was really interesting, I think it was two years ago at our academic roundtable, and uh, he's a professor at Stanford. Um, he said that he, I thought it was an amazing talk, he said he, he literally, with every new thing that his lab would invent, they would go to the incumbent uh, company, like in his case, Cisco, like it was a new networking invention, and literally just offer them for free all of the inventions. Um, and he said sometimes they would say yes, in which case we would say, okay, fine, let's go do our next thing. Let's invent something else. And when they say no, he'd say, okay, well, that might be interesting because it might be like too futuristic for Cisco and therefore let's go do it. Um, and, and apparently he said Stanford just let him do it and didn't, I don't think had, I think they're, I don't know exactly how it works at Stanford, but it sounds, from everything I hear, I guess some, Dan, you might know, but. You are, okay, so so yeah, so I think it's very liberal is my understanding. Um, and um, they, they then, in that case of NYSERA, nice went and did this company, and you know, and so that, it's just a very different kind of philosophy, um, and it's worked very well. It's just very hard, I know like I've tried to, I, I went to Columbia undergrad and I've tried to argue this philosophy to the administrators there, and they, it's just a very hard argument to make because it sounds very counterintuitive to most people. There's also outdated legislation. There's the, I think it's called the Bayh-Dole Act, um, which actually requires uh, university, uh, is it, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like university research is paid for by the public. Um, there has to be, uh, the, the financial rights have to accrue back to the public. Um, and so right? um, a lot of universities are still grappling with that. So I, I think a really good reform would be to just eliminate that law and let universities make these decisions on their own. But that's not happening anytime soon. I think we have time for one, one question. Yeah. Peter, Peter talk Levine yesterday uh, about sort of a contrarian view of investing. Um, he sort of pointed out the investment in Tachyon Nexus of, you know, many people saying, oh, that uh, storage is not going to get uh, as flat, and when it does, then Tachyon is going to be in a good place. So, having a contrarian view for investing, he was sort of espousing as an important sort of concept for the firm. How is it that the firm in, in, in embodied in you guys are sort of talking about your worldviews and your your lenses and yet uh, you know fairly openly and yet you still have the ability to sort of find the things and identify the things that that others aren't so why don't you yeah talk about the your theory on this the which theory <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the strong weak or? good ideas that look like bad ideas. Oh, oh. or you can talk about strong weak yeah this is, about. It was a, this is you're, you're asking like this is a whole book here of material probably we could talk about but um, um well i'd say a couple of things like one is venture capital works very differently than the public stock markets for example where it's not here we just sort of decide okay let's invest in this company this company a lot of it is frankly the entrepreneurs drive the process and decide who do they want to work with so it's just that that's probably a common mistake uh, outsiders make about this industry, and they think, you know, Chris had this great idea of like I'm going to go invest in X or Y. And instead, uh, there's some of that. Like you have to be smart about what you want to invest in. But but frankly, a lot of what we do is we try to build an institution that's that just is the most attractive place that entrepreneurs want to come. Yeah. And so a lot of the business is frankly about that. Um, and and a lot of the investments we've made that have been, been successful are investments other VCs wanted to make, and we just the entrepreneur chose to work with. I mean, that, so that's it's it's kind of reversed from that's not how the public markets work. You know, the 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 pharma stock doesn't choose the hedge fund, right? Like it's it's the opposite. So um, so that that's a big part of it, I would say. I think the other thing is that um, it, it, you could talk about your broad ideas. You know. Um, 
mobile phones will change, you know, are changing the way that you know uh, services are provided or something. It's also it's very different to find the right set of entrepreneurs working on a specific idea. Often, um, uh, Peter Thiel has talked about how a lot of these, you know, like Airbnb is a great example where very early on it looked like a really kind of ridiculous idea. Um, a lot of these things. Um, you know, you can you can speak publicly broadly about the you have to be contrarian, but like actually, in the moment, figuring out kind of the the puzzle of a of what of a particular startup and whether it makes sense and the team makes sense and the timing makes sense ends up being a very applied. It's probably like in, like more like almost like an engineering problem. Like you can talk about lots of broad principles and still going and actually building the program is a, is a is a very different thing. And so. Um, so Chris likes to say that basically, like, so basically, the advantage big companies have, advantage big companies have, they have all these resources. So they've got you know Cisco and Intel and all these companies, got all these engineers, and they got all this money, and they got all these people, and it's just all these customers and this brand and this sales force. So they have all these huge natural advantages. And so if there are any good ideas that are floating around, they're just going to go do them. Um, and so, for example, Apple, you know, is doing great in smartphones. And so a really good idea would be a smartphone that's like you know half as you know half as thick and has a battery life twice as long. Like that's a really good idea. People would really love that. That. Apple fully understands that, and they're spending billions of dollars trying to make that happen. So we can't fund a startup against that good idea. Um, we um, basically um, uh, have the disadvantage, as a consequence, that we can't do those. And so the ideas that we can fund are the ideas that look like bad ideas, right? They're the ideas that just look silly or stupid, specifically to the big companies. Um, and so, um, and, and then of course, the, the, the twist to it is, uh, out, out of the universe of ideas that look like bad ideas, most of them actually are bad ideas, <laughs> um, which is something you can very easily learn the hard way. Um, and so, you know, and we see, you know, 2,000 startups a year, and, you know, many, many, many them are good ideas that are just too obvious, and then many of them are bad ideas that are just bad ideas, and then every once in a while, there's the good idea that looks like a bad idea, and it's the thing that's just like counterintuitive, and it's radical, um, and you know, and it's it's you know, it, it, and, and by the way, it, it, even there, we're going to have we we assume we basically have a 50% failure rate, so you know, we assume that half the time, um, you know, we're going to back the what we think is a good idea that looks like a bad idea, and it's going to turn out to actually have been a bad idea. Um, the good news with the good ideas that look like bad ideas is when they work, that's how you can build a major new company, right? Because then that, that's the, psycho the psychology under w by which you can get a jump on all the other big incumbents. Um, well, the, and the, the interesting thing to watch when you're actually involved in it is they, people continue to think it's a bad idea for a really long time. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like Twitter got really big before people finally stopped saying it was about like tweeting what you're eating for lunch today. Like, it's, it's amazing how long people will go on saying it. I mean, like VR is a good example where I just, I, I, it's very hard to go see a demo of the latest Oculus stuff and not think it's amazing. Um, it's pretty much, a, in my experience, a one-to-one -one correlation between having tried the greatest, latest demos and being excited about the field. Um, and yet, it's, con it's highly controversial, even within Silicon Valley, you know. Um, so, and, you know, so th that's the other thing is you get, it's, it's kind of a it surprises you how long, in my opinion, how much headroom you get. Um, on these good ideas that look like bad ideas, like in, until you know companies almost going public or generating yeah. billions in revenue, like people still doubt it heavily. Yeah. It's sort of a built-in differentiator saying it's time because it looks like a bad idea for a long time until yeah. somebody says, "Yeah." Oh, and you're kind of in this weird state as the as the startup as well as as the venture firm. You're kind of in this weird state where you want the world to understand that it's a good idea because you want them to like yeah. buy it. You want them to be everybody become a customer of it, but you also kind of want them to continue to think it's a bad idea so that you don't face direct competition. Um, and so it's this really weird schizophrenic, you know, and we can't help ourselves, like we're out evangelizing on behalf of our companies. Um, but yeah, no, we have stuff that we're like, we have stuff that's going incredibly well, where if, you know, if I tweet about it, I just get this immediate backlash of, oh, that's really, you know, that's so stupid. Like, you guys are so stupid. How can you possibly think that that's real? I mean, we have companies and, that are like, you know, 100 million in revenue and yeah. like fanatic followings yeah. and you get you tweet about them and people are like well that'll never no one will ever buy that and you're just right. okay and you can just it's amazing actually you can just like lay out the whole business plan and you can explain how everything works and most people just think it's so ridiculous that it, to this day like to take twitter as an example where it's it's for in anyone in the tech world and in the journalism world for example it's a critical it's a critical business tool right it's it's how we share links and how we share work information publicly in the tech world and like to this day i think the you know and it's a 2 billion dollar revenue business built yeah. in less than 10 years and and to this day i most of the mainstream press coverage still kind of tweet, treats it as, you know, like it's this silly thing for, you know, talking about what you had for lunch or something. Yeah, so, and that it could go away at any moment. Yeah. Um, yep. 
All right. So we can't complain about it too much because it is it, yeah. it, it is our little secret, our little secret weapon. Yeah. Okay. So um, great. Well, thanks. Good. Good. Thanks, everybody.